beautiful. Let's welcome uh, Margo and Kevin Baker back. Really appreciate that. He's going to be playing for us today. And uh, if you see, I mean, after service today, you can thank Margo, but also uh, Sharon uh, Jackson and Scott Eisenhower are rotating through to help us uh, have our music on Sunday mornings and do continue to keep us uh, in the prayers as we have begun that search for a new music director and music teacher for the school. So, but we uh, are certainly thankful that you're sharing your gifts with us today. I uh, want to also remind you next Sunday, it's a fifth Sunday, so we're going to have a special service of healing. And we will have communion at both services. The service are going to really be exactly the same early and, and late service. And in those, we'll have a, a quiet time to pray for spiritual healing, and then we'll have communion and our confession absolution as a part of that part of the service. And then we'll also have a time, quiet time to pray for emotional relationship healing, and this could be for us or for our loved ones. Uh, if you want to share any particular prayer requests for the healing service, uh, be sure to let us know in the office this week, and we can include those also on the on the back of the prayer page. We'll probably do the prayers in that order. And then finally, prayers for physical healing. And I've asked some of the elders to come, and uh, during that time, if anyone wants to come up, uh, we'll anoint you with oil and, and I'll pray over you for, for healing and strength as well. Uh, just a couple updates, too, in our, in our prayers. Today is also Life Sunday, so we thank God for the gift of life from conception until it's God-chosen ending point. Uh, we do have uh, families who've lost loved ones recently, and we certainly pray for comfort and peace uh, for them. Most recently, uh, Norma Schaefer uh, passed away on, on the 12th, and their family's going to wait till uh, later on, kind of post-COVID, when they can actually get together for her memorial service, but we can keep uh, her daughter Kathy and other daughters in our prayers as well, and Norma's family. Richard Day was hospitalized at Baptist with some heart issues, and Janice Brackett is recovering from surgery, so we'll add them to our prayers today. Let's stand. Our theme for uh, learning, <coughs> learning to love today is sacrificial love, and our verse uh, from 1 John is, this is how we know what love is, that he laid down his life for us, so we're really going to focus on Jesus' sacrificial love, and and our opening hymn, very familiar to us all, Jesus Loves Me, hymn 588. <laughs> Beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. I invite you to kneel as we do take a moment and 
personal time of confession.
first two readings this morning. The first reading is found in the Old Testament in Psalms 139, 1 through 10. Search me, O God, and know my heart. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit, or where shall I free from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, the second reading is found in the New Testament, in the book of 1 John 3, 16 to 24. Love one another. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in the word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are the truth, and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his Son, Jesus Christ, love one another just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in God, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he has given us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we join in the Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. And together we confess our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. Thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Mark's going to share the children's message with us and the folks watching online with us. Okay. 
Okay, and good morning. Good to be with you again today. For the kids at home, for the kids here, and for all of us kids who are still kids in heart, right? It, I think it's an important. One of the things that our, one of our readings, or our readings we're talking about today is love. Knowing about love. And how do you know that somebody loves you? What makes you know, what makes you feel loved? Sometimes, maybe you hear these words here. These words are... I love you. Has anyone said that to you today yet? Turn to your neighbor and tell them I love you, okay? I love you. And I love you. I love you all. You know, and that makes us feel wonderful, but sometimes it's more than just words that make us feel loved. Now, as you were growing up, your parents did different things for you that showed that they loved you, right? Can you think of some of the things that they did that showed that they loved you? They probably gave you food, all right? They probably fed you. That's a way of saying I love you. They got you clothes, they gave you a shelter, they gave you an education and all these other things. So these are all things that people will do to show that I love you. So I love you is not always something that is done in words, but it's done in actions. And you know, we hear that from God too. God says in his word, he says, I love you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And in that way, God says, I love you. But he also did something. He gave his only begotten son to show us his love for us. When we go to the baptism, wow, what happens? God in action shows he loves us. He makes us a child of God. When we come to the communion rail, we receive his body and blood and the bread and wine. He is doing something. He says, I love you. I forgive your sins. And even when we stop here for confession, God says, I forgive your sins. I'm doing something. I'm not just saying, well, I love you. Okay, you're good. He's doing something. And the interesting thing is in our second reading today of 1 John, that's kind of what it says too. It says, I love you by what I do. And that's how I want you to show love to one another is by what you do. So love, so show love to one another by not only what you say and saying I love you, but in how we do it towards one another as well. So let's pray and ask God to help us. Give us thanks for first for how he loves us, but help us to love one another as well. Let's pray together. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. For letting us know. For letting us know. You love us. You love us. By your word. By your word. And through your actions. And through your actions. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Let others know we love them. Let others know. Not only through our words, not only through our words, but our actions as well. But our actions as well. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Myron. Of course, the Lord showed us how much he loved us and pouring that blood out for us. The ransom price, Lord of glory, you have bought us him. 851. <laughs>
unconditional, sacrificial love of our Lord and Savior fill our hearts today with his love, his hope, and his peace. Amen. All right. Make a fist. That's approximately the size of your heart. The human heart's about the size of an adult fist in an, in an adult. Uh, God's creation, of course, is totally amazing, and there's different parts of his creation that really fill us with wonder and awe. And these things right here that are beating, depending on how relaxed you are right now. If you're asleep later at the end of the sermon, it might be down around 50, but right now you're all awake, so maybe it's about 70. But listen to some amazing facts about our human hearts. Our heart, my heart, your heart will beat about 115,000 times today. That's pretty amazing, 115,000 times a day, pumping about 2,000 gallons of blood through over 60,000, if you took all of our blood vessels and capillaries and all of that, and if you could put them end to end, 60,000 miles. Wow, that's pretty amazing. Here's a little quiz for you today. And I, you know, you've probably heard this one. What day of the week do most heart attacks happen? Anybody? Monday, yes. Monday is right. So that's the day of the week. What day of the year do the most heart attacks happen on? Christmas. Joyce got it. Christmas Day. You know, it's, that, was, that kind of surprised me. Christmas Day. Uh, man out there, you'll be glad to know this, that the man's heart is on average two ounces bigger than the woman's heart. So I always knew that we had bigger hearts, right, guys? <laughs> and actually, a woman's heart beats a little bit faster, especially when they're around us good-looking guys, right? Right. <laughs> yeah. So there's some other things that they've learned about our hearts, too. You know, you've probably heard that phrase, laughter is the best medicine. Well, they actually have found that laughing does releases endorphins that actually do help our hearts. So laughter is good medicine for our hearts. And there is actually a medical condition known as broken heart, broken heart syndrome. And there's the description of it. It says, it seems it mimics a heart attack. It's not really a heart attack, though. The difference is heart attacks happen because of heart disease. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the message. But broken heart syndrome is caused by a rush of stress hormones from an emotional or physically stressful human heart, though, is a pretty amazing thing. But today, we don't want to want to just talk about the heart. We actually want to talk about, because we as human beings, we tend to think about our heart as the seed of our emotion, and especially our love. So in the scripture, when it talks about our, our heart, too, it's talking about what is, uh, how do we love God? How do we love one another? And we've been looking at the epistle of John, his first letter, and some great lessons for us in learning to love. And today, we're going to focus specifically on sacrificial love. So will you read our, our Bible verse uh, with me there this morning? By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Yeah, who's the he there? Jesus, that's right. Jesus showed us what true love is. It is indeed sacrificial love, willing to uh, make a, a sacrifice, to lay, even lay down, as he did, his life for you and for me. But here's the problem, and it's a spiritual problem. We all have heart disease. Now, whether you have good, clean arteries or not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the spiritual disease of our hearts called sin. And what sin does to our hearts. And even in the, in the hymns that we sang already, we talked about having a, a hard heart or a, a cold heart. And that's what sin does. In fact, you know, when you have heart disease, uh, oftentimes it's the, it's the arteries that feed blood back into the heart that get clogged up. They get closed. And that can cause your heart to, to stop beating or not to function like it should. And if you think about it, that's actually a, a pretty good picture of what sin does to, 
to our human hearts, our spiritual hearts, our emotional hearts too. It closes, closes it up and it prevents us from doing what we just read in the verse, from loving our brother, especially when we see our brother in need. And you know what? That can be uh, me. That could be me as your spiritual brother. That could be literally your brother or sister, your blood brother, you know, right there in your family. Sometimes our hearts are hard to those who are closest to us. Sometimes our hearts are hard and close to our brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Sometimes our hearts are closed to our brother and sister as who are fellow children of God. Maybe they don't know him yet as their heavenly father. But think about how, how when we show love to them, it's really showing them that love of God. So that's the problem. We've got, we've got heart disease. And we've got hard hearts. We've got cold hearts. We've got closed hearts. And we need to ask the Holy Spirit to come and to really fill our hearts with that love of Jesus. You know, but here's the problem too. Uh, we kind of fill our hearts up, our minds up with all kinds of stuff. And you know how it works. So if I had like a pitcher here and it was already full, it would be pretty hard for me to pour something else into it if it's already full. And if my heart and your heart, my mind and your mind is filled up with me and what I want, it's going to be pretty hard for God to fill my heart. So in some ways, we acknowledge the disease of our hearts. It's sort of like when we knelt here and confessed our sins today. In some ways, that's sort of emptying our hearts. And, you know, we said, God, I'm just a poor, miserable sinner. I got no chance. I need you. And then what does God do? When we empty ourselves, when we confess our sins, then he pours, as Myron said, he pours that love and that forgiveness into our hearts. And boy, this sentence in our epistle reading today just hit home for me because it's so easy for us to do this. And in fact, if you want to grab your Bible, open up to page 1022. And if you're at home, grab your Bible or grab your Bible app and open up to 1 John chapter 3. And you can kind of follow along there at verse 16. So it's page 1022. And I'm going to have us read a few verses as we go through here. But verse 18, this is the one that was sort of convicting to me as I was thinking about the message today. And, you know, I think sometimes it's always good when I'm going to preach to you to preach to myself first. Because this happens to all of us at different times in our lives. So can you read verse 18 with me? 1 John 3, 18, page 1022. Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And to be honest, you know, we just came off of an election season, and I see politicians, they do that a lot. They're pretty good at talk, but not only so good at following through on the talk. And before you go, yeah, those politicians, they're terrible. Well, guess what? I got a politician in me and you got a politician in you. We all have that occasion where we love with words, but then our actions don't fall in line with the words. So John says it very powerfully. Don't just love, you know, with your lips. Love with your lives, too. Love with action. Put that love into, into action. Show someone how much you really, truly love them. And he even says, not just in words or talk, but in deeds and truth. And to me, that would be saying, well, if I say I care about you, if I say I love you, and that is really true, and I really believe that truly in my heart, then that kind of love moves us to act. Same way that James in his epistle talks about faith moves us to act. You know, he says faith without deeds is dead. Well, we could say the same thing. Love without deeds is dead too. So love will show itself truly in its action. And as Myron said in Tonin, God didn't just say, I love you. He loved us so much that he 
gave, it caused him to give his son. And this verse here, our theme verse says, Jesus loved us so much that he gave himself, that he laid down his life for us. So I want you to hear the story about someone who put love into action. And uh, I don't have my Bible here, but in my study Bible, and if you have a study Bible at home, you know, a lot of times down at the bottom of the page, there are notes. Those are called expository notes because they tell you a little bit more about the text up above. And the reason I'm telling you that is because I'm going to tell you a story about Charles Wesley uh, and how he put his faith, his love into action. So there was a man named Samuel Bradburn who was a friend and associate of John West. John Wesley, you know, was the, really kind of the founder of the Methodist Church here in the, in the United States, going back to England. Uh, anyway, his friend Samuel Bradburn found out, uh, Wesley found out he was in desperate financial need. And when Wesley learned of his circumstances, he sent them this letter. Now listen to his words, his words. Dear Sammy, and he quotes this Bible verse, Trust in the Lord and do good, so shalt thou dwell in the land, and verily thou shalt be fed. Yours affectionately, John Wesley. And attached to the letter was a five pound note, which is about the equivalent of an American $10 bill at the time. And I looked up to see that in the 1750s when they lived, what would, what would $10 be worth today? And it was $400, about $400, a little more than $400. So he put $400 in his letter to his friend saying, trust in the Lord, you know, and he'll, he'll provide for you. And then he <laughs> helped provide for him. And listen to how his friend replied. Reverend and dear sir, I have often been struck with the beauty of the passage of scripture quoted in your letter. But I must confess, I never saw such a useful expository note on it before. <laughs> because the note was, he put his love for his brother into, into action. And really, truly, that's a, a great reminder for, for all of us to put our faith, our love into action too, in loving God, but also in loving one another. So, let's see, what else does the scripture tell, talk to us about the need that we have? So if we said, I have heart disease, you have heart disease, that's our problem. Well, the good news is that God is bigger, and God's heart, and God's love is bigger than our problem. He is always bigger. His love is bigger than my love, his heart is bigger than my heart, and what he does about it, really sort of gives us, a, we want to say, a spiritual heart transplant as God gives us a new heart. And what kind of heart do we need? Well, we need a heart, let's look at this verse again there, verse 16. We need a heart that is really, truly loving. And I like that, that John says, this is how we know what love is. You know, and there's, it's one thing to know here, it's a whole other thing to know it in our heart and in our life. It's one thing to know, you know, that God is loving. It's a whole other thing to know God is loving because we've experienced his love for us. Uh, I always think about, one of the ways I think about uh, was Abraham, you know, when, when he was asked to sacrifice Isaac, you know, and they took this three-day journey to go to the mountain, and even before they went up on the mountain, here's a great faith statement. See, Abraham knew in his head that God was going to provide. Because he told his servants, he said, okay, servants, you stay here. The boy and I, we will go up and we will come back down. So he knew, he was trusting that, that God would provide. And then he gets up on the mountain, you know, and he's ready to slay his son. That's following God. And, of course, the angel of the Lord stops him. And the Lord provides that ram in the thicket. Now I want you to think about, think about the depths of how Abraham knew, not just with his head, but with his heart, that God provides. The difference between when he went up the mountain and having experienced God provide, how he really knew that in his heart, in his mind, and in his soul, coming down off the mountain. 
And you, so you and I know what love is because we have experienced the love of our Savior Jesus who laid down his life for us. You know, in the Gospel of John, Jesus says, no one takes my life from me. I am laying it down. He willingly made that sacrifice for you and me. That's why we just sang, you know, Lord of glory, you have bought us. And it was his blood that was the ransom price for us. That's the depths of his love for you and for me. So this God who loves us so much gives us the command to love one another. In fact, with this new heart, having a heart transplant, a spiritual heart transplant from the Holy Spirit, giving us a heart more like Jesus, it's a heart that is empowered to love with a sacrificial love. It's also a heart that's empowered to follow, to obey the commandments that the Lord gives to us. And in our readings today, Jesus actually gives three commands. Uh, we heard in the Gospel reading too, he said, repent. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And remember, repent means to turn. And so it's kind of one of the things where we recognize is our hearts are, are leading us astray. So we need to stop and then turn back to God. So that's what the word repent means. And, you know, when we re repented today, when we confessed our sins, there's an interesting word in the Bible, the word contrition. And the word contrite or contrition actually means to be crushed, to have something crushed. Basically to say, God, I know my heart is hard. I need you to crush my heart. Listen to this verse from the Psalms. This is uh, Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. That's the word contrite that we would often translate that. Close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, blessed are those who poor are poor in spirit. That's basically realizing and say, God, I need you to crush my frozen, hard heart. So that's the repent part. And then he says, and believe the gospel. Believe the gospel. Believe in me, he says. Believe that Jesus did lay down his life and believe that, again, he took it back up, which we celebrate on Easter. And what do we say on Easter? He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Believe the gospel. And then he says, now, having been restored in your relationship with me, show that love to each other. Love one another. And that, by the way, is going to be our theme next Sunday as we celebrate a special service of healing that we want to ask God to help use us to bring healing to people too spiritual healing and emotional healing uh, relationship healing and even when we can help them when they're physically in need of healing you know how can we come alongside of one another and we truly love one another with a sacrificial love but I don't want you to wait till next week to start loving one another in fact I want to give you a challenge today to try every week to do some sacrificial act of love for another person. It might be somebody in your family, it might be somebody in your church family, it might be somebody you don't even know, but look for those opportunities to love with a sacrificial love. You know, where you're giving of your time, or your efforts, or even your treasures to help a brother or sister need. That's putting our faith in action. That's loving not just with words, but also with deeds, as the Lord did for you and for me. So to love one another deeply from the heart. And sometimes that means we got to kind of uh, open our hearts up a little bit more. I've read this story different times in my ministry over the years. Maybe you've heard it before. It's a story of uh, a squad in World War II. They were in France and one of the members of their squad was killed. And they didn't just want to leave him there where he was. And they had seen there was this church that had a cemetery not that far back. So they, you know, they picked up the body of their slain brother and, and took him to the cemetery, the church cemetery there. And, and they, they asked the, the priest, can, can we bury our friend in the cemetery? 
happened to be Catholic, and he, he said, is he Catholic? And, he, and they said, no. And he said, well, this is for Catholics only, and so then they didn't really know what to do, so they went, well, can't just leave him here, so they, right next to the fence, uh, around the, the cemetery, they, they buried their friend right there, and then they went back to join the rest of their troops, and, and the next morning they were about to head off again, and, and they wanted to go pay their kind of last respects to their fallen uh, brother, and they go there and they can't find the can't find the grave. They're out, out there looking right next. Well, it was right here next to the fence. Well, then the the priest comes out and he says, "I was up all night. The first half of the night, I was up thinking about what I had told you. The second half of the night, I was up moving the fence out to include." Now, I don't know if that story ever really happened or not, but it's a great story, isn't it? It's a great illustration of really what we need to do. We need to move the fence and the boundaries of our hearts. Because sometimes we say, well, they're not like me. I don't have to love them. They're not in the same faith as me. I don't have to love them. No. You know, and even in our mission statement, what do we say? We celebrate and we share the love, hope, and peace of Christ with everybody who's inside of our fence. Is that what we say? No. We say it with with all people. For God so loved the world you know, that he gave his son for, for everyone. He wants everyone to know that love and have that same faith in, in, the, in Christ that you and I have as well. So love one another. And I, I have another story which I do know is true and I can uh, I don't know this person but having been to Haiti, Margie and I have been there a few times, I can say to me this is a, a great example and I I've seen this uh, similar actions in, in, as we call Watson, our Haitian son, how he's made sacrifices for his family. But um, there, there was a group of missionaries who had gone to Haiti and they were doing some kind of discipleship training. They, they found some men and women that they thought could help lead the church, you know, after they left. So they were doing this Bible study and training. And there was this young man named Miltador that was in, in the group. And Miltador, had something not, not a lot of Haitian families have because Haiti is extremely, extremely poor. He had a cow for his family. Now you might say, a cow, big deal. But the cow provided milk for his, for his family. And uh, eventually, as it would grow, they could you know, have offspring and sell those and help provide for the family. So having a cow in Haiti was a, was a big deal. Well, it just so happened that the missionaries got to this reading that we're reading today, 1 John 3, 16 to 18. And, and to be honest, I can relate to this too. Because when we went to Haiti, um, I was going to be teaching, uh, and Margie was going to be teaching the, the wives that were there, Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I literally asked Pastor Isidore, how can I teach that I shall not want to people who don't really have anything? And he didn't even bat an eye, and he said, oh, we have nothing, but we have everything. And this kind of fits this story, too. So here's what, here's their verses, verse 16 to 18, if you want to follow along. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. So he said, well, it's in the Bible. I'm going to go ahead and teach it, even though the Haitians are in great need. And he did. Well, the next week when they're gathering for their time, they, uh, they were checking in with everyone. And they said, well, how's your cow doing? And Milton Orr said, I don't have the cow anymore. He said, my brother was in need of uh, some doctor care, some surgery. And we had no way to pay for it, so I sold the cow and gave him the money so he could have his surgery. Now that's sacrificial love. That's the kind of love that you and I cannot do by ourselves. We need some stints <laughs> in our hearts to keep them open and beating and alive and warm and loving. And this is the good news. One of those stints is the Holy Spirit. He dwells in our heart, and He keeps our hearts open and loving. And the other stint is Jesus Himself, that He dwells with us. 
He dwells in us. So in the early church, too, if you want to see a good picture of sacrificial love, uh, Acts 2, 42 to 47 might be a good uh, something for you to read today. Um, so that's the description of the early church in the Bible. And there was an early church historian, his name is Aristides, and he uh, lived in the second century, you know, it's like 125-ish uh, AD. And listen to how he described the early church. And as I read this description, wouldn't you love this to describe your heart, my heart, our hearts? They walk in humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. They despise not the widow and grieve not the orphan. He that distributes liberally to him, he that has distributes liber liberally to him that has not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof and rejoice over him as if he were their own brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the spirit and in God. And when one of their poor passes from the world and any of them see him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their number is imprisoned or oppressed in the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. If it is possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there is among them a man who is poor and needy, and they have not abundance of necessities, they fast two or three days so that they may with supply the need with their necessary food. That sounds like sacrificial love. So let me end with this statement. The more in love you and I are with Jesus, the more of Jesus' love we will have in us. Amen. And may his peace and definite love that does surpass our human understanding may guard and keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's stand now as we ask uh, the Spirit to create those clean hearts within us. Continue to lift up the Swisher family and Marge and the Sea Liver family. Heavenly Father, too, be with those uh, suffering from the COVID uh, illness and thank you for the vaccines that you are providing and we pray that they will be effective in helping bring this pandemic under control. May you continue to be with our first responders and all those on the front lines of dealing with the pandemic. We also pray for our 
new president, President Biden, for all of the other elected officials. Thank you for those who have finished their terms of service. We pray for our local, state, national officials that you grant them wisdom, Father, that they can make good, God-pleasing decisions that might uh, continue to allow freedom for the sharing of the gospel. In our prayers for healing, we lift up those battling cancer, Mark Henschel, Evan Duncan, Greta Hawley, Chanel Westerheim, Ruth Lyons, Jeannie Hyman's sister Vicki, Kim Lumpkin as well. We pray for Kathy Brown and uh, Sharon Baker, Joyce's daughter-in-law as well. We lift up to you also Pastor and Jane uh, Fransman as they deal with Alzheimer's. Uh, may you bless all those who suffer from that disease and their caregivers as well. Thank you for successful surgeries for Ed Cry and for Carl and Mary's daughter-in-law, Barbara. Be with uh, Richard Day and those uh, trying to figure out what his heart issues are. Thank you also for blessed being with Janice Brackage as she underwent surgery this past week. So for these and all the other needs upon our hearts and minds, we offer them to you, loving Father, with thanks and praise as we join now in the prayer which our Lord has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Thanks be to God.